things you're not Boy, all back, no bag, baby, it's such a decoy Neck between my teeth just like a dog toy I'm stuck in is up wisconsin happy new year it's the first time you get to hear from me hopefully not the last time and who is me who is this voice coming to you from the radio during what is called the maggie dawn show the maggie dawn hour (laughs) uh well it's not maggie dawn so that should narrow it down a bit it is instead anya her producer don't worry uh, the the blight is almost over. Uh, the drought ending. It's it's time. Maggie returns to us, to me, but also to you guys. Tomorrow at this time, T minus twenty four hours before she returns from her very well deserved and hopefully well spent winter break. Uh, but nonetheless, you have one more hour with me, and I'm going to try to get as much in. As I possibly can, what you've just heard is a song that I have been listening to on repeat, Venus in Gemini by uh, Deezy or Desi. It's probably Desi, uh, all capital letters, D-E-Z-I. This is the first song that I've pulled up online to play for you guys and gotten more actual astrology videos, actual information on what it would mean if Venus is in Gemini for you. Um... I have news. Uh, It means that you're going to, um, according to all the astrological stuff that I saw, uh, you're going to be a very busy person with too many friends. So thankfully, it seems that my Venus uh, is not in Gemini. My Mercury is in Gatorade, it seems. I'm not sure what that means for me. But what it means for you is we have a lot to get through this hour. I want to get through it by hearing more from you than of myself today. You can do so. You can contribute to that uh, by calling 844-967-2789. Or you can also text that number. I keep a pretty close eye on our text line. Um, Love to hear from you guys over the written word that is text. And also, if you call in, uh, I'll, I'll screen you during the break and we'll talk and you'll get to contribute. What I want you to contribute to first is... Have you seen the videos coming out of Japan from the huge earthquake they had over the weekend? And if this is the first you're hearing of it, allow me to recap for you. Uh, Japan suffered a 7.5 magnitude quake with multiple aftershocks. So like smaller quakes after the fact. Uh, And they are estimating right now that about 50 some people are dead and they are of course still looking for survivors but this is obviously not the first time japan's had a massive quake not not even the first time in in a long time that japan has had a massive quake um and while it is horrible that people have died obviously it always is i am always amazed at a lot of the videos i see coming out of japan after a quake or a tsunami because What you see is the ways in which Japanese um, architecture, whether it's from hundreds of years ago or whether it was built this past year, that Japanese architecture, quite obviously, because of the code of their law and the the nature of where Japan is, these are earthquake-proof or kind of earthquake-aware buildings, but not just buildings. The video that tipped off my interest in discussing this was actually... Uh, Not a video of a building shaking during the earthquake at all, but rather a video of uh, a statue at a temple, what appeared to be um, a religious temple in Japan. And this this statue was pretty simple. Think of like a base and then essentially what looked like a rook, a rook from a, a chess set, but about seven feet tall. And initially, the video shows you a very thin stone moat and the water is being shaken very unnaturally back and forth across that moat that's how powerful the earthquake is 
And as this very powerful earthquake earthquake is shaking the water in this moat, you start to see this tower-like statue not crack and not fall over, but it's actually wobbling on its base. Now, unfortunately, this is such a strong earthquake that at the end of this video, this pretty old religious statue that was able to wobble and sustain or su survive most of the earthquake at the end of the clip it does tilt too far it, it it wobbles and it does fall down and it hits this bridge this little stone bridge on the way down and it shatters but but it's an incredible display of how even hundreds of years ago thousands of years ago when these temples were being built the people who lived there had to be aware of the earthquakes. And I don't say this in like a, they necessarily knew what magnitude was or they measured it the same. What I'm saying is there was no just ignoring earthquakes. In ancient Japan or current Japan, there is no, well, I understand that you want the building to be earthquake safe, but it's just not in the budget. Or we understand that you want the statue to be earthquake proof, but it just doesn't contribute to the overall artistic design. Neither of these are um, options, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Neither of these are routes that one may take. The decision that was made, the correct decision was, no, if you're going to make something here in this place where we know that there will soon be another earthquake, you must build it in a way that it's going to do its best to survive that earthquake. And that takes time, effort, energy and not the least of which, money. Now, I'm describing to you a, 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 a temple, a stone statue from uh, a period of time where maybe the cost of making it wasn't the main concern. But of course, one would, would create such works of art for religious purposes, even before one would make them for, say, you know, I want to build a big statue because I would get paid to make a big statue, right? But nonetheless, the, the thesis is there. It has to survive an earthquake even if it's expensive, even if we have to change the layout of the building. It has to be done because otherwise people get hurt. <clears throat> I immediately, my mind immediately went to uh, the earthquake that was maybe the most, not life-changing because it didn't change my life, but the most eye-opening to the the threat that earthquakes were, the most eye-opening to how how devastating earthquakes could be in my lifetime, which is, of course, the 2010 Haitian earthquake. Now, I want to be really queer with, clear with, um, I do want to be really queer, but I also want to be really clear in what I'm about to say, which is that I have no interest in accusing Haiti or the Haitian government of, quote, not putting enough effort into earthquake proofing. That is not my argument. That is not my um, my issue. That That's not the point I'm here to make. Rather, this is a point about when we enable communities, places, nations to prioritize things like safety. And in fact, when we demand that places prioritize safety by how we spend our money, which I'll get into in this next part, we actually, we not only see that it's better for just everyone who visits those places, it's, it's better for everyone who lives there in the sense that the people who live there are safer. And get this, if you're safer uh, you might get to keep living. You're more likely to get to keep living wherever it is you are. So let's compare some numbers. Japan just had this quake over the weekend. Again, uh, the number I'm seeing from CNN here is that it was a 7.5 magnitude quake, the initial quake. Some numbers from 2010, or I'm sorry, to back up to the the Haitian earthquake in 2021 that was a 7.2 so that was two years ago but then additionally the 2010 earthquake was a 7.1 so it's 0.4 less than what just happened in japan and yet let's look at the difference in numbers japan is reporting roughly 57 lives lost of course that's terrible any life lost is one too many. But Haiti, Haiti's total numbers coming out of the 2010 earthquake 
in 2010, they had a population of uh, around 10 million folks. There was still a, a reported, and of course I'm vamping because where is the number? Here we go. Uh, the, 2020, the 2010 quake claimed 300,000 lives. Now again, weaker earthquake Far, far, far more people dead. And of course, we don't know what the final number coming out of Japan is going to be. But coming out of this weekend, the number sitting at 57 lives lost. I don't think we're going to see it climb to this this number we saw out of Haiti in 2010. How can it be? How can it be that a quake 0.4, you know, uh, scales less of magnitude, a smaller quake. How is it that a, a quake so much smaller killed so many more people? And of course, the answer is quite obvious why it happened. Because the buildings in Haiti at that time were not earthquake proof, were not earthquake resistant. They collapsed. That's how the vast majority of folks passed away, is buildings collapsing onto them. Of course, we look at Japan. If more buildings, if more ceiling tiles, if more furniture had collapsed onto people, we would have seen higher death tolls. That's how these things work. So why aren't we seeing those numbers come out of Japan? Well, it's because their legislature, their communities, their neighborhoods, their culture to a certain point prioritizes safety, how to remain safe, what keeps people safe, what would be an unsafe practice, not just for individuals to engage in like hey, when you feel an earthquake, don't decide that that's the time you want to go hang up the chandelier in your kitchen. But additionally, what is safe for communities when you see the sea recede, when suddenly the, the ocean is pulling away? That's how you know a tsunami is coming. These things are actually taught there. We're going to get into after this short break uh, a little bit more about how maybe we as Americans or we as Wisconsinites can kind of engage in this version of forward thinking, this version of community action that actually ensures people don't die in the first place instead of just reacting to uh, people getting hurt after the fact. Once again, this is Venus and Gemini by Desi. Back to the Maggie Dawn show where whether it's me, Anya, or Maggie Dawn hosting, you never, ever have to live in a man's world. I would never do that to you. That sounds awful. A man's world? God, that'd be like this one, except where the men are in charge. That sounds awful. Anyways, coming to you live from a par uh, parallel universe, apparently is me, Anya. Hey, again, if you didn't know, I'm the producer of the Maggie Dawn Show. Usually Maggie's here. She's not today. She'll be back tomorrow. And we are talking about the ways in which, uh, essentially the prioritization of safety, of consideration, of making the right choice because it's the right choice to make, is something that, while I'm sure it is not always present in every choice that the Japanese government makes, uh, an incredible maybe demonstration of it is in how Japan's buildings are built to withstand, uh, um, excuse me, are built to withstand earthquakes. The way in which Japan society is built to withstand surviving earthquakes by the way that they work on teaching their kids where to go and teaching adults and teaching newcomers and uh, actually innovating in sciences that help people survive. Like, these types of beds that can detect earthquakes and they drop you into a, a compartment within. Now, I get I get it. That does sound like being buried alive the normal way. But from what I'm hearing, it's a bit more comfortable and survivable than that. Or even in-home pods that you get into 
uh, if there's no other way to escape the tsunami. These are things that are being worked on and faci- the, the, the facilitation of getting those technologies into the hands of what would ostensibly be Japan's working class is something that's actually happening. Think about what emergency preparedness looks like here in America. When I say to you, like, prepping for an emergency, so I, I think a lot of people will hear that and go, yeah, okay, prepping for an emergency. But I think maybe the first thing many people think of are preppers, emergency preppers. And when I say that, perhaps now your mind goes to things like uh, folks who are buying bunkers and dehydrated food and they're living up up in the Pocono Mountains or the Smoky Mountains or whatever other mountains they're up in and they're waiting for the end of the world. And this this is not necessarily the type of thing (laughs) I'm trying to encourage people to engage with. But to look at the death tolls in the wake of what is ostensibly a record a record breaking quake, the 7.5 magnitude quake that quite literally rocked Japan over the weekend. In fact, so much so that they're seeing massive waves hitting California from the aftershocks of this. The death tolls, while staggering, because of course we hate to see anyone pass away from these sorts of things, uh, that number is still at 57. And while that number will grow as, uh, unfortunately, folks are found uh, non-responsive, no longer with us in the debris of this quake, that number will still rise, I anticipate. It is not going to rise to the number we saw in 2010 when an even smaller quake, a 7.1 magnitude quake, hit Haiti where I don't have the first weekend death total. I I did genuinely try to find, like, when did we know how many people had passed away? That information, I couldn't find it. But when all was said and done and the total numbers were added up, the Haitian quake in in 2010, if I could find my words today, the Haitian quake claimed 300,000 lives. And while I still anticipate the Japanese death toll to rise, I do not anticipate it rising by... 299,950 more people. Um, I just, based on what they're saying about what's left to be uncovered, I don't think it's going to be like that. So what's the difference? The difference is that when we look at the histories of both these countries, we see very parallel stories in some ways. We see incredibly rich lands, rich in culture, rich in resources, um, island countries, I'll note, who both, some more recently, uh, some more in the, in, the, in the past, in various ways, have been subjected to some form of, an, of, of oppression. Haiti, you have an island taken over. You have an island used for the slave trade. You have a slave revolt. You have this, the, the folks who were involved in that slave revolt then being charged the, the financial obligation for having had the audacity to not want to be slaves anymore. All of this contributes to a future wherein Haiti is not a country that has money for, uh, as Google told me, what are these called? Um, Seismic isolation bearings, which is what Japan uses in their skyscrapers to help their skyscrapers wiggle and wave and not break over or snap over and, 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 you know, cause an even larger loss of life. You don't have seismic isolation bearing money. When your generation and your children's generation and your grandchildren's generation and additionally your parents' generation and your grandparents' generation were asked to pay off a debt owed to a nation, France, it's always the French, isn't it? A debt owed to a country, a debt owed because you threw off the shackles of your oppression. Now, if you're thinking... Anya, this has, you don't know anything about Japanese history, clearly, because there was no slave revolt in Japan. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there was a slave revolt. But let's talk about the atomic bomb coming off of the summer of Oppenheimer and Barbenheimer. But more specifically, the fact that not even 100 years ago, this country, the United States, used that country, Japan, as permanent testing ground for not one but two 
of the most deadly bombs, the most deadly things ever created. Now, Japan, for a number of reasons that I don't have time to get into before we have to go to these community messages or even really time in a whole, in a whole episode, has bounced back in that short amount of time. The technology boom and tourism, different things, they have been able to, through grit and determination, quite frankly, a lot of the times, uh, uh, un- undo a lot of the setbacks done by colonialism, imperialism, not to mention just the war. That's not to say that I forgive Japan for what it did during World War II. Don't ask me, the Jewish studies major, to do that. But come on, we can recognize how these two places across the world from each other, and yet in similar seismic situations, how one is able to sustain 7.5 magnitude quake and thankfully walk away with a loss of life that, while tragic, is not, uh, uh, you know, while tragic is is much smaller than what it could be, when we see other nations uh, uh, deprived of the capital that they were meant to have remain within their own nation unto themselves, uh, quite obviously not be able to pay for the same uh, the same necessities to survive quakes like this. Sounds like things that would happen in, again, a man's world, a place we definitely don't live in, right? This is Man's World by Marina and Muna. Welcome back to the Maggie Dawn show hosted by someone who is ostensibly and also literally not Maggie Dawn and someone who is also hopefully not preaching insanity like this song just mentioned this song of course being I disagree by Poppy but instead this is me Anya did that sentence make sense in the end I'm gonna have to look at that written down after the fact anyways we're talking about earthquakes we're talking about emergency preparedness we're talking about the ways in which nations who have had some financial success and also financial distress, how that, how that ends up affecting folks well far down the line from those historical events, such as, is there perhaps some link between the fact that Haiti, uh, the, the historical things that happened to Haiti, the, the claiming of its natural resources by folks not from Haiti, the use of that land for the slave trade, the uh, extortion of the descendants of those slaves for the money, quote unquote, cost owed to France after the fact. Do, do those things perhaps, in theory, have something to do with the fact that when a big earthquake hits Haiti, the buildings that they have built cannot withstand that. In fact, maybe those buildings break apart worse so than here in the U.S., much less in Japan, where they're built for this sort of thing. And when those folks die, is that in some way perhaps still connected to the depravement, the the removal of capital and wealth, resources, people, energy, uh, autonomy even, from those places like what has happened in Haiti continuously and also has happened to Japan at different points in its history, both in the contemporary sense and in the historic sense. All these questions and more, I do not leave up to this next caller to answer, but I do greatly look forward to her insights. 
Uh, as soon as I find the button for the phone, there it is. Oh, my goodness. Hello, Joanne. How are you today? Oh, fantastic. And it's a wonderful topic that you brought Thank up. You. Especially the linkage between culture and preparedness. I was in Honolulu in 2018 for um, a cyclone that, that was a little less uh, uh, devastating than was predicted. It dumped a lot of rain on us, but it didn't have the direct hit. But all during the a uh, few days that we were concerned about this. Uh, I was at a conference and all of that, and and uh, all the people from the states, like myself, looked around dumbly and all of that, and the Hawaiians would be warning us and saying, nobody's going to be coming to save us. We're in Hawaii. This is not the states. It, you know, people won't be coming from another state with supplies. We will have to fend for ourselves. And there That's was right. a, an amazing camaraderie that I saw emerge uh, from what could have been devastating as a as a as a cyclone, uh, but luckily didn't come out uh, come come out that way. And so, just to uh, extend the the discussion slightly, if we could all be thinking about what would happen if the power would go out, what That's would right. happen if we couldn't plug in our phones and all of that, and maybe do an exercise. Maybe we should just have a day with no power or something, so that we get. Um, get to know where our batteries are and where a generator can, can be found and all that. Those exercises can really be of help. And I know that the Hawaiians uh, had a lot, when, it, when I was looking around for power generators and all of that during this earthquake, I mean, I'm sorry, the cyclone experience over there, um, indeed we were, we were told where things were. And there were backups everywhere and uh, again, it would be an excellent exercise for us to be doing that in the Midwest. So thanks again for an amazing topic. Well, thanks so much for an amazing answer, Joanne. Yes. And we do need to start doing these things in the Midwest. And if you're going, we need to be doing earthquake exercises in the Midwest. Here's all I'm going to say. We started calling it uh, uh, climate change for a reason instead of just global warming. Guys, the climate is changing. No matter how much Ron Johnson thinks that this isn't affecting us, Please go look out your window, Wisconsin. Where is the snow? That is how you know things are changing. It is January. I had to look at the calendar. Second, I see no snow and I'm from this state. All right. So if you want to say we don't have to worry about earthquakes in Wisconsin. Okay, go back 10 years ago on this day. What were you doing? Were you shoveling? I'd put good money on it. Right. So maybe we do all need to just 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 top off our knowledge of what to do if an earthquake does hit. I don't know. Perhaps there will be some new uh, <laughs> seismic fault somewhere near us. You never know. Or it feels like you never know anymore, at least. Right. Going to the text lines. Remember, you can always text in 844-967-2789 or call in like Joanne just did. Excellent example. Uh, I'm going to take a look here. What do you have here? Jim from Appleton. Greetings, Anya. Greetings, Jim. Uh, you have not seen the quake. Uh, everything in the ring of fire is bad. Hey, I get that. It is, uh, I have never been in an earthquake, thankfully. But again, these videos from Japan, if you think you don't need to know how to be prepared, take a look at what happens. Because like Joanne said, very eloquently, much better than I'm saying right now, um, what she, she she proposed this idea. Maybe we should have a day uh, without power. And that's, you know, kind of a, a pre uh, testing thing to make sure that you're ready for an earthquake. But here's the truth, right, is that there will be a day without power, either in your house or in your neighborhood or in our whole city. Uh, you just won't know when it's coming like a pre planned thing. So best to plan one of those days in your house a day to know where everything is. Because he here's a great example. When I moved into the apartment that I'm in right now, I moved into a building. First of all, it's a building that's about 100 years old. <laughs> it only has like six or seven outlets in the whole thing, which always check how many outlets are in the place you're moving into and where they are. But the first night I move in, it's about 1 a.m. after moving all of my stuff in. Everyone who helped me move had gone home. I have a mattress on the floor surrounded by boxes. That's it. And my air conditioner. And I thought, oh, well, I'll just plug this in because it's so stuffy in here. I need it. And I went to, I, I plugged my air air conditioner in. And uh, it was so strong 
that it blew the fuses, the physical fuses in the fuse box in my apartment. I lost all power in my apartment at 1 a.m. First time ever having to use or learn what uh, a fuse is or how to take one out without electrocuting yourself. So I would say it can happen on that first day you live there. It could even happen on that last day as you're moving out and any time in between, right? Maybe that's a good time to know where your things are. Because I'll tell you what, uh, as soon as that power went out and I was just in that maze of boxes, uh, unlabeled moving boxes for the most part, because that's how I moved, uh, it was a little bit scarier than I would have anticipated it being. Let's move on to something that is not scary. Well, maybe scary in an anxious way, but Let's talk New Year's. This is the first time I've I've seen you, talked to you since New Year's. How have you been? I've missed you. And also, do you have any New Year's resolutions or, as I'm starting to call them, New Year's revolutions? I'm not starting that, but I think it sounds better than resolution. Call in if you do, 844-967-2789 or text in. Um, and let's discuss resolutions that aren't just... Uh, body based. I'm looking at a, at some numbers from Forbes Health. I will just do the overview quick. Um, first of all, it seems like everybody and their mother, specifically their mother, want uh, one of their resolutions to be about losing weight, toning up. That's totally fine. It's not really what I'm interested in. Um, I'm really interested in this stat that only about three percent of people who have a New Year's resolution said that their New Year's resolution is to be better at work. Who are those 3% of people? There's 12% of people in the U.S. trying to quit smoking this year. I applaud y'all. Go for it. I hope you're able to. Uh, and a few less people than that, 9% of people this year want to learn a new skill. I have decided that this year is the year that I finally finish learning German and start learning the guitar. I'm, I guess I'm going with a a G theme for this year, guitar and German. And especially if you have some that you're looking to do this year, give me a call. Um, I really like this one coming in just underneath uh, improved fitness with 48% of Americans want to improve their fitness, improve finances, improve mental health, lose weight and improve diet. Uh, a quarter of Americans want to make more time for loved ones. I like that. And I like someone entering this year knowing that they need to do that. Now, what's interesting is what this stat tells me is that about 75% of Americans want to make less time for loved ones. And that 75%, I want to say, I see you, I feel you, and I am probably statistically with you. <laughs> but outside of that, um, setting New Year's resolutions is kind of uh, something of the past, it seems. Uh, there's a lot of young people not setting any. I totally get that. I can't even really say that any of the ones I'm setting, uh, I'm going to stick with for the year, mostly because all of my resolutions or revolutions I have this year are repeats from previous years that I never got to finish or that I never quite got the feet of the habit under me. For example, something that was really popular when I was in film school was everyone would try to watch, and this is going to sound insane to most people, everyone would try to watch about one film or more a day, and you would round out your year with, at minimum, 365 new films under your belt, which of course isn't even a fraction of the new films that come out every year, not to mention how are you ever going to, especially for people like us who were in film school, how are you ever going to cut through all the history of the year? But I think a much more approachable or maybe meaningful version of this uh, that I really like to encourage people to play with, this is the version of it that I'm going with for this year, is to try to watch one film from every country, right? We kind of view, quite obviously, the U.S. as the film capital of the world, and then behind it, the U.K. and Germany, Australia, Canada, places like this. But uh, my big takeaway for this year, not takeaway, my big task for this year is to try to make sure that in addition to watching all the great films coming out of America, Canada, Europe, these things, uh, to also make sure I'm watching at least one film, maybe if it's not new, uh, maybe something from the great, again, history of film from places I usually never watch a film from. Like, what's your favorite film from Fiji? Ignoring alliteration there. <laughs> or your favorite Turkish 
a romantic comedy. Who has one? Maybe I will at the end of this year, right? I like to sometimes gamify these things, like saying try to get one from every country or do one every day. Because sometimes that feels a lot better than just saying, like, I really need to broaden the films I've watched. I say that as someone who wants to write film. You may say, I need to broaden the books that I'm reading. A way that I'm doing that this year, when your to-be-read pile feels indomitable, feels feels like you absolutely cannot pick a book to start, <laughs> much less read it to completion. This is my new thing. Because when there's infinite choices, you sometimes get just paralyzed by it and then you're not making any choice at all my new thing is I'm just going to start reading books by author last name I just alphabetized my book by author last name and I said I'm going to read one book from an author starting with a then one from an author starting with b then one and you see how this works I don't have to explain the alphabet to you but this way I'm not staring at a huge wall of books going, oh my goodness, which one am I going to pick? Well, if I read that one, that one would be good for work. And if I read that one, that would be good for, uh, uh, you know, this other thing. And this one is for my, um, what's the word I'm looking for? My job. I couldn't think of the word job. Of course not. Uh, as you can tell, maybe I'm not in that 3% I mentioned earlier. Of course I am. But um, <laughs> uh, to gamify, instead of looking at that huge wall of books um, and saying, oh my goodness, where do I start? To just say, all right, here are my, what, four or five books that have an author whose last name starts with A. I'll pick one of these to start and then the next and then the next and then the next. And if you disagree or agree, I want to hear from you. 844-967-2789. This is I Disagree by Poppy. I disagree. Everything in your life is a tragedy. Wisconsin to the Maggie Dawn show, the first of the new year, wherein we are talking New Year's with me, Anya, her producer, Maggie's producer, that is, the person who's usually here during the Maggie Dawn show. It makes sense, right? It's all coming together. I know, I know. We're pretty clever here. It's called the Maggie Dawn show and it stars Maggie Dawn. It's genius. All right, what's also genius, or maybe not, it's up to you, is that you can call into this show and talk to me if for some reason you'd like to do that uh, by calling 844-967-2789 or texting us through the app, texting that same number. Uh, let me know what you're thinking. In the last bit, uh, we were talking New Year's resolutions, New Year's revolutions, things you may want to do this year. Uh, I discussed trying to watch more films and read more books and all these things about our bodies and stuff. But let's talk about predictions. First of all, if you have a crazy prediction for something happening this year, and I'm talking Jan 1, 2023, you would have called the uh, the whole uh, billionaires in the submarine debacle. If you have if you have predictions for this year. I would very much like you to text in specifically because I think you guys will be a little bit more rambunctious. Um, but additionally, come and tell me that. Tell me your predictions for this year. One way to divine some predictions for the year, if you're thinking, how would I even go about getting that info, uh, comes from a tradition out of Spain, the 12 grapes of luck. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it in Spanish, but the idea is, OK, it's New Year's or it's New Year's, the second day of New Year's, like it is for us today, you go out, you buy a bunch of grapes, and then you eat 12 grapes of the bunch. And each one, in order, is going to tell you what that month is going to be like for the year. 
So you eat your January grape. Ooh, was it tart? Okay, you're going to have like a tart, maybe a sour month. Maybe money won't be so good, something like that. February grape. Ooh, it's really sweet, but it's kind of mushy. I don't know what that would mean, <laughs> but you get how it works. So if you want to know, are you going to have a sweet month? Are you going to have a tart month? Are you going to have a month with a little mold on it? I'm trying to think of other ways to describe uh, a grape. <laughs> uh, you can find out by divining grape. You can you can do some 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 grape divining if you want through doing that. I didn't do it this year. I don't think I've ever really done it. I saw some videos saying that uh, this tradition's kind of been co-opted and that you do the 12 grapes and whichever one is the sweetest, that's the month you'll finally meet the love of your life in. And I learned this through a video wherein two girls went to the store. And the whole way they're walking to the store, they're explaining to you, the viewer, this tradition. And when they get to the store, there are no grapes left in the store because every other single woman in the city had had the same idea. So what I'm saying is get out there and get some grapes today before any more of this January goes on with you, you know, not knowing how it's going to go. The grapes are out there to tell you, right? Uh, Mark says, Happy New Year and another great show to kick off the season. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we've got a prediction here that uh, Elon's going to crash a cyber truck. I would get behind that that prediction. I could see that happening. I'll put that on my 2023 bingo card. Um, and this is, a, this is a really nice one. My New Year resolution is to reconnect with five friends I've lost touch with. I, and, 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 and this is a, a note from the texter, which I really love is that they've written, five feels like an achievable number. Uh, hell yes, texter. I love setting, I love that you are setting achievable goals. Me, I'm out here setting ridiculous goals, like watch one film for every country and all sorts of other types of math that don't make sense. But I love the, the, the concept of this, to reach out to people, to set a number of people to reach out to, to give yourself the year to reach out to that, that many people. Because you know what would be the worst is trying to do all five of those relationships, sending out those texts or, or sending those calls on January 1st, right? You give yourself some time. Everything about that plan, texter, unnamed texter of wisdom, I vibe with it. I like it quite a lot. Last few moments for you to send me your New Year's resolution. It doesn't have to be nearly as wise as what this unnamed texter has just sent me, although if it is, I'll certainly take it. Um, in these last three minutes before we go, I will hint to or talk about one more New Year's tradition. Now, this one I, I, I left for last because I couldn't find where this is from. I remember being told about this when I was a kid. And if you recognize it, please text in. I was told this was a Brazilian tradition, but I don't want to attribute it to Brazil if it's not. But this idea that you should do uh, things you want to do a lot in the new year. You should do them three times on New Year's Day. Now, if I were a responsible uh, <laughs> folk salesperson, I would have told you about this theory before New Year's Day, right? So that you could plan to do things three times on that day to ensure you would do them a lot in this coming year. But I'm an agent of chaos. That's why I work in talk radio. And so I ask you to reflect now upon your Jan 1. Is there anything that you did three times that day? Because perhaps now, just like divining from the grapes, we can divine that which you will do a lot of this year. I can say on January 1st, yesterday, I slept in. I saw some friends. Uh, I had a fairly decent time. But I'll say this too. I got like an inordinate number of uh, bruises and stubbed toes yesterday while working around my house. And if that is a prediction for my year, um, I, I might be okay to just bow out now. I, I don't know how much of that I can take. Um, hopefully you can take a little bit more of hearing from me. I have a strong guess, a strong feeling that I'll be asked to chime in on Civic Media's next show coming up right after this, Busted Pencils, Educated Educators, Talking Education. My understanding is that we've got both hosts back tonight alongside a great guest. I hope you'll tune in. I hope you'll listen to it. And then after that, what do we have that late at night? Oh, we got Nightlight now with Pete Schwaba. That's a great show. If you haven't yet, check it out. It is 
uplifting and way better to listen to than all this politics stuff that we end up talking. You've been great. I've been Anya. This is Cult Leader by King Mala. Mala. I'll see you tomorrow with Maggie when she's actually back. How awesome. Okay, bye. Bye.